Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the penultimate uh, session of Congress uh, today. Really important, you know, along our themes of broken things, uh, I think we're all very aware of the housing crisis we've got here in the UK. And we heard that uh, challenge as well from uh, Andy Burnham earlier, that he's keen to know what the cooperative options are. I was in, I've not had a chance to talk to you about this, Blaze, but I was in Vienna uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, they, if you're Viennese, you're able to live in the city affordably uh, because it's regulated by 40% housing co op. So we're here to learn, understand, see what we can take away from today, and uh, over the moon to have with us uh, the Chief Exec of our Federal uh, Cooperative and Community Housing, Blaise Lambert. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Rose. Um, I'm Blaise Lambert. I'm the Chief Executive of the Confederation of Cooperative Housing. Um, I'm also the Treasurer of Cooperative Housing International, uh, which is the ICA sector body for housing globally, um, and I'm also an ICA board member. Um, what I'm going to talk about very briefly um, is the key asks that we published in our election manifesto a couple of months ago before we knew the date of the election. Um, we've had our ideas formed up for a little while, shall we say. Um, so I'm going to just introduce the headline asks uh, within our manifesto and then we're going to come to uh, our speakers today um, who are going to tell you about their practical experience within their organisations and communities. Our manifesto splits into two key component parts. Firstly, looking at what actions are we calling on the next government to take to help grow the cooperative housing sector in the UK? I think it's fair to say, as Rose has just touched on, that in many of our neighbouring European uh, 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 countries, cooperative housing is much more of a mainstream housing option and there are a variety of reasons why that's the case that I won't go into today, otherwise I'd take far too much time. Um, but uh, the, the headline asks relating to cooperative housing, there's three of them here. Firstly, what we don't have in the UK is we don't have a bespoke legal form of tenure for cooperatives. There is no such thing as a cooperative tenancy. That is not the case in other countries. It is the case in this country. It means that essentially what our members do is they dodge around landlord and tenant legislation that is not really created for member-based organisations. So our first ask, and this actually picks up on something that, uh, um, uh, that, uh, that the Labour Party were pushing as a private member's bill a number of years ago, which is the need for a Cooperative Housing Act to create a form of tenure that will place cooperative tenants on the same secure footing as other social housing tenants in this country. Secondly, the current government introduced a raft of community rights a number of years ago in their Localism Act, um, but they don't really do the job when it comes to making available uh, land and buildings for cooperatives to develop, because they have a six-month window, and quite frankly, the idea that a community group will come together, form, establish a business plan, put the finance in place, bid for the site within six months is not realistic. It doesn't work. The principle is good, but we need more than a six-month window to get, it, to get it all together from scratch. What they have in other countries like Switzerland is a presumption in favour that when public land and buildings are being disposed of, first they are offered to the cooperative and community sector ahead of the private sector. And that sort of presumption in favour would create the opportunity for the cooperative movement not only to develop homes, but to develop other forms of community business on those sites as well. And thirdly, access to finance, not just a housing issue, an issue right across the cooperative economy, particularly in new start-up, um, ends of things. So again, ca calling on government to invest in a financial intermediary to provide access to low-cost capital finance for cooperative housing organisations that currently are priced out of the market um, by a combination of the risk appetite of lenders and institutional investors and the fact that many of the competitor organisations, be that private house builders or the very largest housing associations, have long established track records of building homes in this country so lenders view them as lower risk. The second part of our manifesto looks more broadly across the social housing piece and en enhancing resident empowerment, Pr spreading the principles of cooperation into the local authority and housing association sectors. Local authority tenants 
since 1993 have had a legal right to, to, to establish management cooperatives to take over the management of their, their council estates. There are currently just over 250 of these co-ops in council housing, managing just over 120,000 homes. No such right exists if you're a housing association tenant. And so the first thing that we're calling on is a level playing field is created for housing association tenants to have the same rights to establish management cooperatives as local authority tenants have. Secondly, we've been delivering the government's residence empowerment program across the entire social housing sector for the last 18 months. We called it 4 million homes. Um, they originally called it the Resident Opportunity and Empowerment Grant Programme. Um, but when I looked at the letters of that, it spelt R-O-E-G, which, which was a bit close to Rogue. And I didn't fancy delivering the Rogue programme. Um, so we rebranded it the 4 million homes programme because there's 4 million social homes in England. Um, and it's been a very successful programme, um, and we want, uh, we want government to continue to invest in that. It's a programme that provides information to residents about their rights and responsibilities. And thirdly, the current government abolished the, the very infant uh, national tenant voice that was established between 2008 and 2010. We're not necessarily calling for a, a resetting up of what was previously set up, but we do think... Um, there is strong reasons why an independent resident voice for social housing tenants is very important. That will amplify residents' concerns both nationally and locally so that all residents' are heard, voices are heard by policymakers and landlords. So there's my details. If any of you are particularly interested in contacting me, um, I'll leave them for a second. Now I'm going to walk back over here um, and introduce our panellists. So, um, first of our panellists today um, is Casey Edwards. Um, Casey is from Compass um, in, in, in Wales. Um, so, you are the community led housing programme manager at Compass um, and you work on the Communities Creating Homes programme. Uh, this is funded by the Welsh Government and the Nationwide Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about the scheme, about the project, and the other work that Compass is doing in the community and cooperative housing environment? Yep, no problem. Thanks, Blaise. Um, so like Blaise says, I'm Casey. I'm from Compass, which is a uh, cooperative development agency working across Wales. Uh, we were formerly known as the Wales Cooperative Centre, so you might have come across some of my colleagues, I'm sure, at, at a congress uh, in the past. Um, we've been going for over 40 years and our heart is very much uh, in the cooperative and community uh, sector. So we help to set up and to grow cooperative, um, cooperative structures, social enterprises and sort of community businesses. We do a lot of work around community shares as well and, and also helping people uh, digitally to get online and also helping people to set up care co-ops. So we're a national organisation and have various different programmes um, Within, within Compass. Um, I work specifically uh, on the Communities Creating Homes programme, like Blaise said, which is funded by the Welsh Government and the Nationwide Foundation, and we are Wales's uh, community-led housing hub. Um, it's funded, like I said, by the Welsh Government, um, and they are great supporters of uh, cooperative and community-led housing. It's written into the programme for government, um, and, and there's cross-political um, party support for cooperative housing. Um, so we, as a programme, we provide advice and support to community groups who want to set up housing co-ops and other forms of community-led housing. Um, and we like to say that we provide support from um, conception of an idea to then completion of the homes. Um, very importantly for us, those homes have to be affordable. Um, obviously, because we're funded by the Welsh Government, any communities that we support have to actually be providing um, affordable housing. And we've had commitment from our Cabinet Secretary uh, for Housing, so just as a sort of in, in terms of context, housing is a devolved issue, so obviously the, the Welsh Government have, um, have powers over, over housing in Wales. Um, and in terms of that affordability, the Cabinet Secretary has committed to uh, community and cooperative housing being included in their targets to provide uh, 20,000 social homes um, by 2026, which is when our uh, next Welsh election is. 
Um, and just another piece of, uh, sort of context, there's never been any sort of large-scale capital funding for community-led housing in Wales like there has been in England and across the UK. So our communities are having to find uh, very innovative solutions to actually getting these projects off the ground. But that's what we're, we're there for, is to, is to help them along that way. What the Welsh Government have done recently is give um, pre, some pre-development finance for one of our groups, which is we're seeing as a bit of a game changer for the sector in Wales and hoping that that will set a precedent for further groups coming forward. And that, uh, that funding is for a, a part self-build project uh, in Swansea, which is in South Wales. Um, and they're pr providing 14 affordable homes um, for local people. So we're really hoping that that can stimulate the sector in Wales. And just to give an idea of, of the, the scale of the sector, we're supporting around 38 groups across Wales um, to develop a pipeline of 276 affordable homes. Um, and obviously that probably sounds like a drop in the ocean to uh, some, of the, some of the numbers that we have in terms of cooperative and community-led housing um, across England. But for us, obviously, it's a sort of a growing movement. And I do think that once a couple of these schemes get off the ground and built, then we'll see an influx of, of more of these projects coming forward. So that's a little bit about Compass and what we do. Uh, thank you, Casey. So uh, if I can ask a question. Um, so what do, you, what do you see the benefits that, that, that are coming through the Communities Creating Homes programme, both for the tenants themselves, but also the broader community? Yeah, no problem. I think... Obviously, affordability, we have a big focus on affordability, so be, be, being able to provide affordable housing is obviously a massive tick in terms of uh, being a benefit. But I think for us, what we're realising is some of, some of those wider, um, softer benefits uh, that you might say. So we did some research um, back before the pandemic now in terms of some of, the, some of the softer benefits that people were experiencing from living in cooperative and community-led housing. Um, and what we found was people were less isolated, they were less lonely, uh, they had more confidence to, to maybe go out and speak to their neighbours, even more confidence to go out and find, find work potentially or volunteering. Um, and also obviously they're, they're learning new skills as well as they're developing the, these enterprises. So there's definitely wider benefits than just you know, the, some of the typical benefits that might come to mind when you think about affordable housing. Um, and then we, we, again, did some research during the pandemic, and what we find, found was that people living in these housing schemes felt more secure. They felt like they had, obviously, a say over their tenancy. They weren't as worried about their sort of rent arrears and things like that. And obviously, they felt part of a, a supportive community um, that, you know, were maybe shopping together or obviously perhaps socialising together a bit more than you were able to as a, you know, just a sort of standard... Um, resident in a neighbourhood. So I think for, for me, it's some of those some of those softer benefits that are really um, that that's, you know speak the words essentially. It's not just about the affordability. Um, and in terms of the wider community, I think perhaps sometimes people have seen housing co-ops or community-led housing as quite insular, and obviously they're just sort of providing homes for themselves. But I think the majority of the groups that we work with are always looking to provide either services or facilities for the wider community and really want that open, you know, the wider membership rather than just a sort of insular community uh, looking out for themselves. So I'd say those are the benefits. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to introduce uh, Claude Hendrickson, MBE. Um, Claude, you're, uh, you're here representing Leeds Community Homes and People Powered Homes Leeds. However, your, your involvement in this sector stretches back more than mine does, right back into the 1980s. Um, so um, can, can you tell us how, where and, and why you, you started getting involved in cooperative housing and, and specifically about, you know, uh, the journey that you took into community-led self-build? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you and good afternoon. Um, my story, yeah, I, it, it started 1988. But I think it started a little bit before that because um, I'm um, a child of the, gener the Windrush generation. My, my parents came here in the late 50s. Um, so I lived in that time where there was no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And housing was a fundamental. Um, and we watched our parents going from slum landlord to slum landlord as we was coming through as young children. So later on in life, um, as single black men, and when it comes to w the waiting list within housing, 
men are always, especially if you're single men, you're at the bottom of the list. And if you're an ethnic minority, you're at the bottom of that list. So what we decided as a group was to take on solving our housing issue whilst getting skills, as you mentioned, soft skills like employment and training. So we set about setting up Frontline Self Build, which was a group of 12 unemployed young black men. And we built our own houses. Um, we laid 92,000 blocks, 52,000 bricks, um, 8,000 roof tiles, built 12 semi-detached houses, um, which went on in building them um, to set me up to go out and lobby. So for the last 30 years, I've been lobbying for community-led housing to why I last year received the MBE for my work around community-led housing. Um, <laughs> and I only mention that because Blaze threw it in at me. But yeah. Um, so I've been involved in community-led housing back in 1994, setting up the community, being a founder member of the community self-built housing agency, which was based in Bristol. And at that time, later on, we did some projects with um, ex-veterans, because what we realized was that more than 50% of all homeless men are actually ex-veterans. Um, and they'd served the country, but now they'd fallen on bad luck. So in Bristol, we did a number of projects. I've um, then gone on to meet Blaze on, on, her, on the, on the um, community-led advisor training course. Um, I've now become the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion associate with Leeds Community Homes and People Powered Homes, and he mentioned as well the Four Million Homes program. I'm the EDI trainer on that. So I've, I've continued over the last 30 years to bang that drum for people led being involved in solving their own housing issues. Um, so yeah, I'd like to leave it there. I, you know, I'll come to the next question. <laughs> well, the first question that I'll ask then is, um, how easy did you find it to get your project up and running back, back in the 80s? Um, I don't know. I, I think, and, and I say this after traveling around Europe and visiting other, other things, that there were a lot of barriers. It's almost like, you know, the first question was asked, why do you want to do it? Why do you want to solve your own problem? Why, why don't you just wait in a queue for somebody else to solve it for you. Um, so yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing was, number one, they had a really negative perception of black ethnic minority men at that time. And I wanted to prove them wrong. So I wanted to prove we could be invested in, we could be, um, we could deliver a project and we could use the finance right. Um, so that was, that. I'm very much a pusher against the grain, and, and what I realized um, living in a predominantly disadvantaged community, because when I often say one of the first things I had to learn as a young black man growing up in England was the difference between Irish people, English people, Welsh people, and Scottish people, because there is a difference. And you know, and, and, and meeting Blaze again, I keep coming back to this because I've, I've had very strong relationships with Irish people because they seem to have suffered a lot of the issues that we had to deal with. And, and I think, you know, picking up on what you just said there, and it's certainly in housing in the UK mm. and, 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 and for cooperative housing, this is a real challenge in the UK. Mm. Is There is this perception in the UK that if you can afford, if you can afford to buy, you buy. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, somebody else is going to provide you with a home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either that's a private landlord or a social landlord, but ultimately, somebody else is going to do it for you. Yeah, yeah. And, and pushing against that, which 
is something that in so many other European countries that just isn't the case. Mm -hmm. You know, people, people don't ask that question. It's, it's, it's something that's an established norm. Um, so I very much recognise that, that, yeah. that narrative as well. Um, in terms of self-build itself, mm. what, what are the broader benefits that, 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 that you found beyond just having, you know, creating somewhere to live? Mm. What are the broader benefits that came from being on that self-build journey, so to say, for you? Um, com um, confidence, self-respect, but actually all the self-builders gained construction skills. Um, the plan was that when we finished the project, we would tender for work and give other people the opportunity to be employed. So there was a whole, it was a stage one, stage two, stage three, and t 30 years on, many of them young guys that were young then, and myself included, who are now older, are now in the construction industry, employing other people, and, and still delivering construction work. So 30 years on, we've got a strong legacy, and that legacy in Leeds has gone on to support other housing initiatives in Leeds, um, Chaco, which is a, a co-housing project that just finished, Canopy Housing, Latch Housing, Lilac in Leeds, all of them were projects that came after what we did with, with um, Frontline self Build. That's great. So I'm going to move on now to our third speaker today. How are we uh, going to follow that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I shall build you up. Um, uh, Jamie, Jamie Barakada is the, uh, the chair of Belgrave Neighbourhood Cooperative Housing Association, which is the largest um, social housing cooperative in England. I think you've got just under 400 homes. Your former chair, um, Chantelal Matwana, used to argue with me about who had the biggest co-op um, when, when, when I lived in Brent in a co-op with 450 properties. We, my, my former cop doesn't have that many anymore, so I suppose um, Belgrave won out in the end. Yeah. Um, uh, Jamie is the, the, the newest uh, member of CCH's board, and I'm really pleased that you joined CCH's board just a month ago, yeah. um, and looking forward to, uh, to, to you playing a, a really important role over the coming three years um, initially yeah. as a board member. Um, so, so Jamie, um, I understand that you've got a background in, in the public sector, um, in working in social services, um, but, but recently, you know, you've become more active and prominent in your housing club and you're now the chair. Um, do you want to yeah. tell a bit about the story okay. and the journey? So I'm going to be reading, so I'm really sorry, everyone. Um, okay, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I've worked in various social services departments over 25 years with Leicester City Council. My role went from developing services to planning and commissioning for people with physical and sensory disabilities and those from ethnic minority communities. What I saw and experienced was a huge gap in understanding and delivering of relevant services. There was little understanding of issues or barriers that people face with disabilities and lack of, I have to say, pretty bad lack of understanding and sensitivity towards people's needs with ethnic minorities. Um, there was a real learning curve for the local authorities as to how little they actually understood about the people they were supposedly serving. And it's really not until a lot of these issues were highlighted, whether that was done through community consultation, whether that was actually done through places of worship you went to or you know, local centres that were running and actually talking to people and finding out about the services that were lacking was when a lot of those issues started to be highlighted. I'm not saying that they've got it right, we're still nowhere near getting it right, but hopefully we're, getting, we're going in the right direction. I noticed we've even got um, Zinthia Trust here today, so people like Zinthia Trust are doing some amazing work out there with a lot of the diverse communities. Um, I was also involved in delivering race awareness training to local authority staff to try and help bridge a gap there. Basically, after all this, I'd become really unwell and retired on medical grounds. And it was only after retiring on medical grounds, I got involved in my own housing co-op. Um, and it was a time that we, at a time that we were facing various challenges. I very soon found out that BNCHA was being mismanaged with poor governance. 
neglect to carry out essential repairs, lack of communication, integrity, tenant members, completely no transparency or accountability. We're at a point where we actually nearly lost the co-op. And especially when Blaise says that, you know, that the history of BNCHA is so rich, it's, it came from a place, and Claude has just reminded me as well, we started 50 years ago, and 50 years ago, Mr. McQuarner, amazing gentleman, and if I can even follow in his footsteps like 20%, I'd be really chuffed with myself. But it was literally like a whole group of people that had been expelled from Uganda at the time, and City Council were basically demolishing a whole load of properties. Mr. McQuarna actually got involved, the properties were bought, and that's where BNCHA was born. Um, and he did actually do some amazing work. Sadly, he passed away. It was about 12, 15 years ago he passed away. And it was after he passed away, the whole co-op kind of crumbled, sadly. Um, so anyway, I kind of got talked into joining the committee at the time. Didn't know anything about housing co-ops, didn't know anything about being on a committee. So it wasn't, too, it wasn't long after that I actually got taken on as the role of the chair. So that was pretty crazy, yeah. So I was literally just kind of thrown in running. But one of the first things I suppose I, I thought about when we came in was like, okay, why are we not talking to our tenant members? You've got a community there and if, all right, I'll be honest, the first thing I did was Google what a cooperative meant. There was loads of things that came upon like Google and it was on Google you're going, wow, okay, this is about a community from my understanding. And if it's about a community, why are we not talking to the community? So literally, I remember taking Rupal, who's now our member engagement officer, but at that time, she was my best friend and she still is. But we literally went door knocking to all the tenant members. So when ne nearly 400 properties were door knocking and we're going, hi guys, this is who I am. Tell me who you are. Tell me what your issues are. Tell me what the co-op means to you. Do you even know? Most of our tenant members didn't know who their landlord was. And that's something three years on we're still working on. So as far as their landlord was concerned, it was the service provider. So then you're trying to explain, and that's kind of like the th last three years has been a lot about bringing that education about and kind of saying to people, this is your cooperative, this is what it means to be a cooperative member. Um, but anyway, so the active membership uh, strategy was the first thing that we started. I can happily and quite proudly say that CCH, um, basically gave us the award for the active membership strategy in 2022. So that was pretty cool. Um, we have employed various methods to engage with our members, including door knocking, surveys, workshops, day events, activities. We also hold regular policy sessions um, where people get to actually say what they want in their policy, how they want their housing cooperative to be run. One of the things that we found, because we do a lot of social media, so we put everything we do, it can be whatever it is, but everything's on Twitter, everything's on Facebook. Um, we actually ended up having local community members kind of arguing with us to kind of say, well, why weren't we invited to this? Why weren't we invited to this? And it's like, especially policy sessions. And it's hard to kind of explain, well, actually this kind of is more relevant for our tenant members. But then when you're thinking about it, it was kind of like, well, we're part of that community. So should we maybe not be involving community members in as well. They don't necessarily have to be tenant members. So a lot of our work that we do now also carries the community with us. Our approach um, has been empowering our members with knowledge and information and how cooperatives should be run. Also, this is also following on from like a lot of the poor governance that we'd had before. So it's kind of just educating people to say this, this is what a cooperative is, this is what it represents. This is your role in a cooperative. This is how you play your part. Um, we've got, I'll try not to waffle, okay? Because I always do this, I write a script and then I never follow it. Um, beyond communication, we've initiated several community projects that strengthen both our co-op and the Belgrave community at large. And we do try everything we try and do, we kind of involve the community with us. So at the moment, this is something that we're really proud of. We in partnership with an organisation called Reaching People, uh, we set up the Belgrave Food Hub. It's the only type, um, only, only one of its kind in Belgrave, and that's quite a large, large area of the city. 
which is also quite financially challenged. So the Belgrave Food Hub is a resource for members and the wider community providing essential food supplies. We've got the community garden that we set up in um, partnership with yeah, Rutland Wildlife Trust, and they've been amazing with that. So again, that's just been about pe bringing people together, building confidence, growing food, and just enjoying nature. And we did, a couple of weeks ago, we've had a fantastic pond put in as well. So yeah, and attracting, and I'm an animal lover, so it's attracting nature in as well. We've got our actor sessions. They started as the Warm Spaces Initiative. That's um, now turned into a regular meet and greet group. And um, ECTA basically means oneness, it means unity. So it's just about bringing the community together. And I'll, I'll mention that a bit further on as well, because we had, um, most people probably remember, we had the Leicester disorders last year. Um, and it was really sad. So we had quite a few of our tenants kind of approach us saying, I don't know if you're aware of it, so, but anyway, we had quite a lot of the tenant members approach us saying, as a housing cooperative, what are you likely to do? So we basically set up something called the um, Belgrave Unity Project, and that was just about bringing lots of community service providers together and just giving people a voice. So it was about bringing the voice up from bottoms up rather than authorities up there telling the communities how it should be resolved. It was about getting the communities to basically talk about how they wanted to resolve this issue. I'm going to shut up now, but, um, yeah. Thank you, Joe, really. Sorry. Um, Thank you. So we, we see stories in the news all the time about the, the, the UK housing crisis. Indeed, I, I've, I've been in this sector, the broader housing sector in this country for 27 years, and... I think I've constantly heard about housing crises, constantly heard about how many homes we should be building but aren't, constantly heard about the number of street sleepers there are. Um, the, these, are these are not issues that go away, they're issues that keep coming back in different forms. Affordability crises, demand crises, build crises. And yet, if we keep on trying to do the same things all, again and again and again, are we surprised that we keep getting the same outcomes here? You know, like I say, I've been doing this 27 years. I'm, I'm just hearing the same stories again and again. The numbers are slightly different. Now we need 300,000 homes a year rather than 150,000 homes a year. But it's the same problem. It's just, it's just compounded year after year. So, what are, what, Casey, I'll come to you first. What, what do you think is the potential for cooperatives, for a cooperative solution to the housing problems that we have in this country? I think for me, the, the real potential in cooperative and community-led housing is actually meeting that sort of micro-level need in communities. So when you know, local authorities and governments do their sort of local housing assessments, they, you know, they, they say the figure of this many homes are needed. But actually, when you get into that granular level of need, they aren't actually providing the right homes in the right places for those people. So I think that's where cooperative and community-led housing can really sort of plug the gap, essentially. And when you know you think about meeting some, you know, not just geographical communities, but also communities of interest. Um, so, for example, we're working with an LGBTQ plus group uh, at the minute who have traditionally been sort of, um, put, you know, experienced poor housing across Cardiff City, and they're now actually coming together to provide their own housing and looking at expand. You know, once they've got their first project up and running, expanding to look at providing more housing for, for people within their community. Um, and a sort of a specifically Welsh problem, I suppose, in terms of uh, the Welsh language and culture. We've seen a massive influx of second homes and holiday lets um, over the last couple of years. And I think where community-led housing can really help to meet the, the need of those local communities by just local people having a voice and a choice um, in how those homes are developed and delivered. Um, so I think that's, that's where the beauty is um, in community-led housing. And we've recently had some um, funding from the Oak Foundation um, to, to help us to try and look at these specific communities 
and how we can bring um, how we can bring community-led housing, um, you know, as an option for them. So we're employing a cohort of interns um, that will be working with traditionally uh, marginalised and mi minority communities to help them to, to raise awareness of, of community-led housing, but also to help think about maybe the barriers that they face for getting involved. So hopefully we can we can spread the word about community-led housing even further um, and really sort of you know help them to meet their their own needs. Then I think that's where the potential lies. Okay. Anybody? Yeah, yeah Claude. I think <clears throat> I think um, empowering communities to be part of the solution because many times when they talk about and they call it a crisis, it's like the communities are the problem, and and it's very much about we can be part of the solution. So with cooperatives and the other forms of community-led houses, we can contribute to help solve the housing crisis. And I think housing is the foundation of communities and communities need community wealth building, which I heard about in another session about, and cooperatives can be that, that platform to give communities a chance to be involved in solving their issues. So I think going forward, I think the outlooks for me looks very positive with cooperatives as long as we do engage communities and, and it's not piped down to them. It's kind of, as um, was being said earlier, it's a bottom-up approach. We can contribute to help solving this as communities. And I think the cooperative music movement is the is, is one of the models that can contribute to that. Okay, I'm going to move along because I'm seeing the clock ticking down here. Um, okay, right. uh, I was in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago with colleagues of mine from Sweden. Um, one in five of every home in Sweden is a co-op home. That number increases in Stockholm to nearer to one in three. Um, colleagues of mine from Germany uh, and I'm going to introduce a, a video in a moment by, um, from a colleague of mine who is the president of Cooperative Housing International. Um, and when I was with him in Amsterdam, I said, uh, I'm speaking at Co-op Congress with a panel of colleagues. Um, could we get a few words from you? And he said, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you want? And so, uh, uh, so this is what we're going to see briefly now. Uh, my colleague Guido Schwarzendahl, um, he's, as I say, from the German cooperative housing sector. Um, he's from Bauveren, Halle and Lerner, uh, one of Germany's largest housing cooperatives with 7,500 homes uh, across four cities in Germany. So, um, so let's play the video. A member of the Cooperative Housing International Executive Board, Blaise Lambert, also asked me to give a brief description of the situation for German housing cooperatives. Look back from the past to the year and now. As you know, housing cooperatives in Germany are a large sector and a reliable pillar of social housing provision. More than 2,000 cooperatives, quite a big number, with more than 2 million flats are really a proud number today. These cooperatives are well established and enjoy a high level of social recognition. However, as providers of rental housing, they are also in competition with municipal and privately financed providers of social housing. This is unproblematic in tight housing markets, as for example in Berlin or Hamburg, but not always easy in relaxed housing markets, as for example my hometown here, Halle, in the former Eastern Germany. This is because the advantages of membership are noticeable in tight markets, but more neglected in relaxed markets. And like all housing providers, the cooperative associations are fighting for land, financing and subsidies in an increasingly competitive environment. As construction costs are rising, interest rates are rising, and our customers' ability to pay rent is shrinking rather than growing due to the noticeable inflation. Added to this are stricter building standards, decarbonization as a result of climate change and the second wave of refurbishments to existing properties. 
New cooperatives cannot be founded in any significant number as a result, but they would be important as a reliable pillar in the ever-shrinking supply of affordable and high-quality housing in our time. In view of this experience, it is more important to continue to promote the housing cooperative model everywhere at all times and with vigor. We are an important part of the solution to close the gap between demand and supply. The service of our members, sustainable and future-orientated. May I wish you a successful event. My best wishes from Germany and here's to good cooperation and cooperatives worldwide. Goodbye. So I'm going to ask one quick question of the panel before I open the mics up to the floor for a brief couple of moments. Uh, just very quickly, um, maybe Casey, I'll come to you first. One thing, what do you think the next UK government to do, should do to help the growth of cooperative housing in the UK? Yeah, no problem. Um, I've got three things quickly. Okay. <laughs> and very similar to your manifesto, actually. Um, we'd love to see a, uh, an affordable revolving loan fund for the, for the cooperative and community-led housing sector in Wales. Obviously, that, that could be a decision the Welsh Government would, would make, but obviously, depending on the, who the Government is in, in um, Westminster, it might, might, might benefit us to get that through. Um, better access to land. We'd love to see improved community ownership rights across Wales, like uh, Isla was saying earlier, in terms of that community spirit in Scotland. We'd love to see legislation that empowers communities to take ownership of, of land and assets to bring affordable housing forward. Um, and for us, planning is a massive issue in Wales, uh, just in terms of the resources that local planning authorities have and their just general lack of awareness of community-led housing. So I think that that sort of lack of awareness and awareness raising activity is really important across the piece to make sure that everyone's aware and, and, and sort of um, it knows about the benefits of community-led housing. Um, for me, the, the most important thing is to promote cooperatives generically and co cooperatives should not just be promoted to people in disadvantage. We should probably be promoting cooperatives right across the board. So no matter what finance you've got, no matter where you live, cooperative living should be promoted or cooperatives should be promoted. So I'm hoping that with this government they're going to promote the whole energy of cooperatives right across the board. It's not just about people living in disadvantaged communities. It's right across the board. So that would be my thing. More money. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm just picking up on what you were saying, Claude. I mean, you know, I, I, I often use the expression, you know, cooperation is for everyone. Mm, yeah. And the thing for me that's held us back in housing in this, this country mm is that we've seen cooperative housing as only being for a very, very narrow part of the population. Yeah. And it tends to be the people on the lowest incomes. Yeah. You know, we don't see this in the way that they do in other yeah, countries. In, in, in Europe. In Europe, countries. in North America. Cooperation is an option for everyone in their housing and their community, not just the sort of fallback position when everything else has failed. Yeah. Oh, let's try cooperation in that area, see if that will work. Um, right, um, I'm going to open up the, 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 the opportunity for two quick questions because I'm mindful of the time and I have two hands up, which is great. So I'm going to come to yourself first. There's mics coming round. Is this on? I didn't hear anything in the asks or the suggestions about regulation of housing. Is that all perfect? Doesn't need any amendment at all to be best for cooperatives? Okay. Um, anybody want to say anything about regulation? Whoa. <laughs> Regulation. I think um, the regulation, I mean, there's a lot of, of that being spoke about within the um, CCH um, and the other, the other strands of community-led housing and community land trust. Um, so it's been discussed. Um, and I think under the 4 million homes, there was a recent announcement about regulations. Um, and how did that go? Well, I think, I think I'd say that the current government has just passed a very extensive piece of regulation yeah. in the social housing sector in this country, the, the 2023 Social Housing Regulation Act. There is more regulation coming down the line, AWAB's law, Decent Home Standard 2, the Competence and Conduct Standards. I'm not entirely sure that what 
our sector requires is more regulation. I think there's maybe a case to talk about regulation in the private rental sector and other parts of the housing market more generally. But I think what we need at the moment is, 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 is more fundamental legislative change and access to land and access to affordable finance. I think the, the, the regulatory framework that's in place is, is, is has had a lot of work done on it in the last couple of years, although it did take a while for that to happen post Grenfell. Um, I'm going to come to the gentleman with the purple jumper on. Hello. Hello. Um, Phil Hartwell, I, I was just wondering, what does the right to buy legislation, what effect does that have on the cooperative market? Okay, well, um, should I quickly take this and then come to yourself, Casey, yeah, maybe? Um, fully mutual housing cooperatives have an exemption from the right to buy under the 1985 Housing Act. Um, so whilst local authority tenants have a statutory right to buy, and whilst most housing association tenants whose tenants predate the 1988 Housing Act have a right to acquire, there is a specific exemption from right to buy for cooperative housing organisations. So, you know, it, actually it's something that in, in certain discussions um, some local authorities view as a, as a positive issue in terms of supporting cooperative housing is, is that exemption from, from right to buy. Um, Casey, maybe say something about the Welsh situation? Yeah, no problem. Um, so the Welsh Government suspended the right to buy uh, a number of years ago, so it's, it's not really an issue um, for us anymore, which is obviously great. Um, and in, in terms of the regulation question as well, um, we've done a lot of work in Wales around the regulation of, of private landlords recently and brought in a, a new Renting Homes Wales Act in terms of the, the standards that private landlords are actually... Um, expected to meet. So I'd agree with Blaze on that, that, you know, that sort of regulation of private landlords is, is the priority. And for me, the right to buy, I think, I think the mistake made with the last tranche of right to buy was that there should be a right to then sell back to the community rather than sell out to uh, a potential purchaser. So I think there should be a right to resell back into community rather than sell externally. I'll be taking that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you all very much. I hope you've uh, in enjoyed today's session. I'd like to ask that you show appreciation to our three panellists in the...